well. Good evening. Welcome on this uh, beautiful rainy Friday night, and uh, we are so glad to have Omir back again this year with us to share more of uh, more of his ministry and uh, more of uh, how God is revealing, continue to revealing the truth of his word to us through archaeological discoveries in Israel. So thanks for being here. And uh, for those of you who are watching online, we are so glad to have you with us tonight and uh, hope that this is a memorable, memorable and educational and inspiring Friday night as well. How about we just uh, begin with the word of prayer and then I will invite um, Dan Ketchum to, to introduce our guest tonight. So let's, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for opportunities to gather. Thank you for your word. And we thank you uh, for those who, uh, those who give their lives to, uh, to discovering and helping us to recognize the, the blessing of your word uh, and just help us to, 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 to continue to grow in our confidence that your word is true and therefore life-changing as well. So Lord, speak to us tonight. I pray that we would not only grow in learning and knowledge, um, but that we would, our, our, our faith in you, our confidence in you would grow deeper and stronger in your name. Amen. Well, Dan Ketchum, would you come and, uh, and introduce our guests tonight? Thank you, brother. Thank you so much, Pastor Jason, and hello, friends. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord, even on a Friday night, because it is Shabbat, so Shabbat Shalom. And I know that we're talking to the choir tonight as we stood around and saw so many of you actually practicing social distancing by embracing Omer. It was just so exciting. We love the way you love Omer, and we know that your love for him is extended to Jewish people in Israel and around the world. So why do we love Jewish people? In a moment, I'm going to introduce to you our brother. He's staying with us again, and he is here at Ridgefield Nazarene for the second time in 2020. Let it be known that 2020 was a very good year for Ridgefield Nazarene. Amen? So why do we love Jewish people so much? Carol and I asked that question before we ever moved to Israel to minister there for more than four years. And the Lord gave us 540 answers right out of scriptures throughout both the Hebrew scriptures and the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant. But here's just one of them from Romans chapter 9, just a couple of verses. This is not a message or a devotional. I just want you to remember why we love Omer Eshel and Michal and Elah and Tamar, wife and daughters, and uh, why so many of us are here on a Friday night. I'm so glad it's not raining tonight like it was last night. Why do we love Jewish people? Here's the reason. Paul says, this is one of the reasons. Paul says to the Romans chapter 9, if you don't like these three chapters, you ought to love them. Romans 9, 10, 11. Romans 9, he says, For my people, my own flesh and blood, Paul a Jew, Yeshua, Jesus a Jew. His disciples, Jewish. The prophets, Jewish. The Word of God, Jewish, and for all of us who have been grafted in. So my people, my own flesh and blood, Paul writes, who are Jewish, Israelites, to them belong the adoption. What's that mean? So remember when Adonai said to Moses, I want you to tell Pharaoh, this is my son, my chosen. And that's exactly what Moses, so he was, Jew, he was saying Jews are adopted. Paul agrees. Belong, to them belong the adoption and the glory, the glory both in the tabernacle and in the temple, the glory and the covenants, both covenants, as a matter of fact, both the Hebrew scriptures and the Brit Chadashah, the new covenant, and the giving of the Torah, the law, the law and temple worship, and the promises. To them, to the Israelites, to Jewish people, Paul agrees it all belongs to them. And then he makes another great statement, to them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, the Messiah, who is over all God blessed forever. That's from the Tree of Life version, Messianic version, by the way, which we love and started reading while we were in Israel. So, that's one of the reasons we love Jewish people so much. But specifically, 
We love Omer like we, we love very few other Jewish people. In our apartment in Jerusalem many times, we've been in his home many times, even for Shabbat and for Passover with their whole family, big family clan. And, uh, and we're pleased that you're in our home once again, brother. You're always welcome here, and I know that you're always welcome at Ridgefield. So, Pastor Jason, Pastor Frida, uh, Justin, Sadie, thank you for welcoming Omer back once again, and thank you for being here on a Friday evening. Just a couple of words. First of all, remember, if you've never met Omer, he's very personable, very, very warm, and um, so I want you to be sure to be able to meet him following our, our evening together tonight. Secondly, uh, he has five languages. He's fluent in five so he's going to be speaking in his second language tonight. Hebrew is his first language. He's in his second language, and he is behind a mask. So just give the guy a break, would you? I mean, uh, it's like you can't see his lips move, and he's going to be talking just a little slower than he normally talks because he's got gusts up to 120 miles per hour, as you know. And uh, so... So we're just delighted to, to have him here. Also, he's brought a part of the heart of his bride. David's wife was Michal, and Omer's wife is Michal. Not the same woman, actually. Not the same generation. But uh, she is the designer and the maker of all of the jewelry in the back and many more pieces that Omer wasn't able to bring. So when you have a moment at the end, you can just stop by the table and, and take a look. We'd, we'd welcome you to purchase any of those. And so thank you again for, for the privilege of bringing Omer back to Ridgefield Nazarene. What, what a privilege. You know, um, as he shares tonight, he's going to be talking about many locations, sites that some of you have actually visited and some that some of us have never been to yet because Omer specializes in places, taking people to places that tour groups normally don't go. In fact, a couple of those places he's going to be describing tonight. But he's going to focus on Jesus, on Yeshua the Messiah, and the book of Revelation. I have not yet seen this presentation. I'm not, I've never seen him presented. I've seen the presentation, but only in PowerPoint. And so tonight we have a very special privilege, and I know you're excited as we are. So let's just welcome Omar Eschel from Israel. He actually, he actually flew from Jerusalem. He flew from Jerusalem through Chicago to be with us right here in, in Vancouver. So welcome, Omar. We love you, brother. And how's this for social distancing? Oh, there you go. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Well... Uh, great to be back, and thank you so much for having me. Frida, Jason, thank you so much. The Ketchums, of course. And, you know, before I start with the presentation, people ask me, why are you coming now to the States? Uh, COVID-19 is all over the world. Uh, we have problems with the, uh, 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 you know, with the election. It's not, we don't know what's going to happen. My family actually freaked out when I told them they're going to be in Chicago. They said, well, there's riots over there. I told them, now it's the time to come to the States. Now it's the time. Not, not when everything is fine and easy and great. Now it's the time to speak about the Word of God. Because when we are happy and content, uh, it's kind of take it, we take it for granted. You know, we're happy. It's, everything is good. God bless us. We bless Him back, or vice versa, actually. And everything is fine. But we need to remember that the true faith and the true difficulties and the true uh, 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 way to honor God is in the bad days and not in the good days. And I said to my family, for me, in a way, it's a crusade. It's funny to say crusade, I'm Jewish. But it's a, it's a crusade for me to come and to support all of our friends uh, uh, in the United States to remind them who we are worshiping and why is he there and very soon, these things, as we say in Yiddish, these shmates, these things, will be gone. But God will never be gone. And we need to remember that. So that's the main reason why I'm here. To all the churches that I'm going to visit, that is the reason why I'm here. And that's why I chose to speak about Revelation. We're going to talk about Revelation at the other end of the presentation. So, um, by the way, is that supposed to be a big screen or a small screen? 
because I barely see it. Never mind. Okay. So I'll just turn back. So what, we, what we're do, going to do today, we are going to speak about the chronological order. I chose several books in the Bible and put them in a chronological order and showing sites that proves what the Bible is talking about. All right? Now, we know that the Bible is true. We know that. We know that. But there's a big difference between something that you assume that it's true because your parents told you and because you believe in your heart that it's true. And it's a different thing where you confront the truth. You see it in front of you. You open the scriptures, you read Joshua 12, here's the site. This is exactly what it says. So we all know the good say, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's... Obviously. But, by the way, you'll be surprised how many archaeologists do not believe that. Well... <laughs> For those of you who remember, the minimalists say, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a cow. But okay, we're not going to go into that. So we are going to analyze different places and show some recent new archaeological, archaeological discoveries that proves the Bible. All right? Okay, let's go to the next slide. So let's start with Joshua. I kind of jumped the patriarchs and I jumped over uh, Exodus and, the, and, and uh, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Let's, let's start with Joshua. In the chapters of Joshua 10, 11, 12, we have a story of Joshua entering into the land and basically take it by storm. All right? He conquers so many places. He basically uh, 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 kicks out most of the Canaanite kings. And we did find several uh, 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 evidence for that. One of them, for example, is the mighty city of Hazor, which we counted in uh, Joshua 10 and 11. We have a major city that speaks about that story. But we keep on seeing, especially in that chapter, in, in Joshua 12, a list of long cities that, they were not big cities like Hatzor. Hatzor was a huge metropolis back then. I mean, it was the head of all kingdoms. So it's very easy to find a huge city. But cities like Makeda, city like Dona, city like Grav, tiny little villages, because don't forget, back then, city is not Chicago. City is about 1,000 people. That would be a city. All right? So, actually, this is a brand new discovery, what we just found. Brand new discovery, when I say brand new, half a year ago. Half a year ago, uh, they wanted to put a new power line to connect to a kibbutz, actually right next to the Ella Valley, where I live, a power line, and when they dug for the foundation of the power line, they found a castle. So, these foundations that you see over there, that layout, is a Canaanite castle, that was destroyed in the year 1200 BCE. And that Canaanite castle is associated with the biblical city of Makeda. If you remember in the scriptures, Joshua takes the kings that fought against him, put them in a cave in Makeda, and that's where they die. This castle guarded Makeda. Now here's an interesting thought. Who were the sworn enemies of the Israelites back then? Philistines, exactly. Makeda is right next to the land of the Philistines, right next to Gat. All right? So who destroyed Makeda? Was it the Philistines or was it the Israelites? We don't know. But what we can find, we can find a layer of destruction that goes exactly the same as the Bible describes in the book of Joshua. Next one. We move a little bit further up, and this is the book of Samuel. Okay? Book of Samuel, I kind of jumped through Judges because we don't have all night here. But Book of Samuel, we found a later uh, uh, archaeological discovery. These squares that you see right above us, these are discoveries of the city of Ziklag. Ziklag. Now I can tell you something interesting. The word in Hebrew for Ziklag is Tziklag. Okay, T-Z, Tziklag. The word Tz is not from Hebrew. All right, we do have the letter Tzadi, but it's a, it's a much later influence that penetrated into the language. Ziklag is actually a Philistine name. All right? Now, Ziklag, we know it very well from 1 Samuel that King Achish, king of Gat, gave Ziklag to King David. And King David in Ziklag was actually tested for the first time. Really tested. If you remember the story when he was on his way up to Mount Gilboa to join the army of Saul, the Amalekites raided this city right here, which I'm going to talk about in a second. 
And they took the women, the children, the men, basically everything they could. And then David went back, freed his people, and there was a debate in the nation. The debate was, he, he actually, you know, gave the loot, the spoil of war, to everybody equally. And the warriors said, this is not fair. We bled, we fought. These guys sat in the back and cooked for us. Why would they get what we bled for? And then David did something which will resonate throughout history. He said, everybody participated in the campaign. The fact that you as a soldier went to the front, someone needed to cook the meal for you, so you're going to have the strength to do what you did. And until today, the Israeli law, because of Ziklag, until today, if you have a military campaign, every single soldier that served in the IDF at that period of time gets a, gets a special recognition that he fought in that war. And that goes all the way back to Ziklag. We found Ziklag. We found Ziklag next to the city of Gat, which makes a lot of sense, because Achish, the king of Gat, gave Ziklag to David. And we have two layers over there. One layer is Philistine, one layer is Jewish. And above that, nothing. How do we know which one is Jewish, which one is Philistine? Pop quiz, what do you think is the biggest difference? What we will find in a Philistine camp, which, or a town, which we'll never find in a Jewish one? What's what? Pork. Yes. Yes, bacon. Exactly right. They love their sausages. Yeah? So, yeah, no pork. If you find pork, Philistine. If you don't find pork, Israelite. And we actually see that. You can actually see this. So you see the layer that belongs to the Philistine, all right? And, out, and right above it, you, you do not see any pork bones at all. You see a Jewish layer completely destroyed. Who destroyed it? The Amalekites. We just, we just read about it. All right? Next slide. This is Kayafa. Kayafa is actually one of the most important places in Israel because Kayafa is the ancient city of Sha'arim. Those who were with me uh, in, in Israel when we were up in Azekah and we overlooked the valley, I pointed out. In the Bible, it speaks about the fact that the Philistines fled after the fall of Goliath, ran through the valley, and were pursued by the Israelites and died on the road to Sha'arim. Sha'arim in Hebrew means two gates. All right? Two gates meaning a city with two gates. And this is the only city that we have in all of Israel that has two gates. Interestingly, interestingly enough, the architecture of Kayafa and the architecture of Ziklag is exactly the same. And you know why? It was one king, King David. He is the one who controlled Ziklag and he is the one who controlled Kayafa. And they're both very, very close to each other. Next slide. We are jumping forward to Second Samuel. This one is I just want to show you. This is the limitation of David that he wrote after the death of Jonathan, after, after uh, Saul committed suicide. And it's interesting that every kid in the fifth grade in Israel needs to memorize this. The hero of Israel on high grounds has to memorize this. This is like the biblical national anthem of the Israeli children. All right? Every child knows that. But here's the kicker. If you're going to ask most Israelis where this was written, they'll tell you Mount Gilboa. Because the curse is on Mount Gilboa, no rain, no dew. But these lines were actually written in Ziklag, that town that we just saw. Because the story tells us that Amalekite came from the battlefield, came to David, and he said, Saul died. And David was in Ziklag because he fought against the Amalekites. Folks, we see it right there in front of us. While we are reading the book, we see it on the ground. Let's do the next slide. City of David, most of you have been with me. I don't want to go too much into this, but you see that round clay stamp? You see that with a beetle? Okay? Sometimes a lot of archaeologists try to disprove the Bible. Why? Money. If you go and try to disprove the Bible, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to support your cause. Okay? But this is how God works. He scattered a lot of evidence around us that no one can dispute them. If I'm going to show Ziklag today to an archaeologist that doesn't read the Bible, or doesn't believe in the Bible, he will tell me, okay, we have a city that is dated to so-and-so century BCE, but it doesn't say that this is King David. So King David didn't exist. We have people like that. As my grandfather used to say, everybody has the right to be wrong. Okay, so, 
we do find sometimes hard cutting evidence no one can dispute. One of my favorite kings in the Bible is King Hezekiah. We found a stamp, this one with a beetle, that says, belong to King Hezekiah. So if we have a stamp that says, belong to King Hezekiah, kind of makes sense that King Hezekiah existed. Right? Kind of, unless someone pulled a prank, a prank about 3,000 years ago, inventing the name Hezekiah. But no, we found the name Hezekiah. And if we find the name Hezekiah, and we find many other names like Shebna, like uh, Malkitzedek, like uh, 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 Jeremiah, like Isaiah. If we find the names, they probably existed. Let's repeat what we said before. If it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably, probably. Next slide. Uh, this is the city of Lachish. After King David, I jumped to the destruction of Lachish. The year 701 BCE, Sennacherib is coming over, destroys Judea, finishing the destruction in the year 722 BCE. Lachish was the largest city after Jerusalem. And our next tour, we're going to go there. We're going to go there. It's an incredible city. So we found, you see those two gentlemen? Next to them, there's a, a guy pointing at a triangle. This is an altar. This is an altar to our God. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not a demigod. This is an altar to our God. But that altar has been laid down, broken, and they build a restroom next to it in order to file it. They will never be able to use it. Why would someone do such a thing? You remember there was a kid in the Bible by the name Josiah. You remember him? The kid king? Josiah, in the age of eight, became the king. And he was one of the greatest kings in the Bible. And what he did, he actually made the reformation of Josiah. And he said, you are not allowed to worship the God of Israel in places apart from the house of God. So up until this, this dig, we had one place called Arad that we've seen the reformation of Josiah. We've seen a full altar to our God. This our God. It's not Asherah and it's not Baal. And it was covered respectfully. In Lachish, we found the same thing. They built a latrine right next to the altar in order to completely dishonor it, but they never used the latrine. They never used it. How do we know? No organic material underneath it. All right, next slide. This is Arad, all right? You see that temple with the two pillars? This is the temple of our God. It's not a demigod. This is not, this is not time of judges. This is Josiah. But he was respectfully sealed and locked, and that's it. No one uses it. So we can see actual evidence of reformation of Josiah. Next slide. Many people ask me, take a sip, sorry. Many people ask me about end of time prophecies. You know, we have the book of Revelation that we read it and it's very graphic and it's very vivid. And people seem to forget, I don't know forget, but people seem to disregard the other apocalyptic uh, uh, scriptures that we have in the Old Testament. Book of Zechariah, chapter 12, is the prototype of Revelation 16. Just for the fun of it, after this presentation, go home, open two Bibles. One is Zechariah 12, the other one will be Revelation 16. It's almost the same story. Almost the same story. And it's amazing. Zechariah was about, give or take, 500 years before Jesus. 600 years before John, all right? And we still have almost the same story. Why? Why did Jesus say it when he was on Mount of Beatitude? Well, not just Mount of Beatitude. He said it all the time. I'm not here to change not even the smallest letter in the alphabet. Kotsoshel Yod, the edge of the Yod, which is the smallest letter. I'm here to repeat the, the words of the prophet before me. That's what he said. So when you look at this, you look at the end time prophecies, and especially the book of Revelation, think of Zechariah. Think of Ezekiel, think of Isaiah, think of Daniel. We're going to speak about the name. How do you say it? The, uh, the great day of the Lord, but this is going to be approaching to the end of, the, of this uh, uh, presentation. Next slide, please. So we have a time between David and, uh, uh, David and Jesus. We know, of course, that J David was the founder of the dynasty of Jesus, and we have a thousand years between them. And if you look at Psalm, Psalm 11, it speaks about 
the, 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 uh, the roots and the connection. And that will resonate again in Romans 11 and in Romans 9, what Daniel was talking about. The connection of the olive tree, the root that is being grafted in. Those stories or those letters of Paul are embedded deeply, deeply, deeply in the Old Testament. Next slide. I want to talk a little bit about Jesus as a, as a child. Those of you who are with us in Israel will recognize some of the places. This is the city of Tzipori, Sepphoris. Sepphoris is a city that is not mentioned in the Bible, not even once. And if you're asking me, has much more importance than Nazareth. Why is that? When you look at Jesus as a character of a child, Jesus came from a little, tiny, little village of Nazareth in the Galilee. Okay? No Facebook, no internet, no Twitter. You know, these, back then, those villages were very much remote. Most of the people never left the village. How can it be that we have a little boy from Nazareth that can go and debate with the greatest rabbis at the temple at the age of four, at the age of 12? How can we have a little boy from Nazareth that can speak to the Gentiles the same passion and the same way as he speaks to the Jews? And it's been accepted by both of them. We have to remember, the people that chased after Jesus were not the Pharisees. They were the leaders of the Pharisees. When the multitude came over to be fed at the miracle of the loaves and fish, they were Jews. Who were the Jews? The Pharisees. It's amazing to look at it. If you read the Bible carefully, you will see the people that followed Jesus were the common people. But they were oppressed by evil people like Caiaphas, like the heads of the Sanhedrin. All right? So, in order for us to understand, and Jesus, by the way, Jesus was a Pharisee. Jesus came from a Pharisee village. Galilee was Pharisee. He wasn't easy. He was Pharisee. When we read the parables, we read the parable of the, of the, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a master's, master seed, master tree. Okay? He speaks about the, the, the parable of the dry fig. Where these images are coming from, if you go to Tzipori, you will understand. Because Jesus was immersed completely in the Bible. Everywhere he looked, everywhere he turned, he saw biblical stories. He lived in the middle of the biblical heartland of Israel. Okay? And that is why he was able to teach as one of an authority and not as one of the scribes. No one sat down. He's not Gamaliel. He's not Paul. Paul was a student of Gamaliel, but he was a scribe, and he says that. I'm the biggest Pharisee. He says that. Paul was a student of a very wise rabbi. Jesus, the Holy Spirit. That's it. But he spoke so well with such an authority because he came from within. He understood the scriptures from within. Those of you who are with me in Israel know exactly what I'm talking about. He could analyze the Bible like no scribe can do it. Because if you sit down in a library, you sit down in a seminary, you have a picture in your mind of the stories of the Bible. If you go to the site yourself, and you make the geographical connection, you can have a completely different understanding of the same story. And that's how Jesus understood the Bible. When you go to Nazareth, you'll see in the middle, the, the second uh, uh, picture above, you see a mosaic. That mosaic is a pagan mosaic that speaks about basically gluttony. It was belonging to a very rich man. And you look at that mosaic, and the first thing that comes to your mind is the parable of Lazarus and the rich man in hell. The minute you see that, and he understood that parable because he worked in Sipori. Why? Joseph, his, his, well, adopted father, what was his trade? He was not a carpenter. He was a tecton, yes. A tecton is a carpenter, is a mason, is a handyman. Basically, if you have a problem, call Joe. Right? Lick your roof, call Joe. Da -da -da -da. That, that's basically it. Now, imagine Jesus as a boy accompanying Joseph. How many leaky roofs you had in, in, in Nazareth? It's like five buildings. That's it. It's a tiny little village. However, Sepphoris is a huge city. So Jesus as a child was embedded into one hand the stories of the Bible, but on the other hand, he saw these pagan homes. And later on, when he was 30, in his 30s, we see how he can speak to both Jews and non-Jews. Because that's what he saw as a child. He understood that. That made it so amazing. And that's why the Bible, people are saying, is this the son of Joseph of Nazareth? What good can come out of Nazareth? Well, apparently a lot. Next slide. 
Jesus Ministries. We have several uh, uh, places that I think are extremely, extremely amazing. You know, there, what did Jesus do when he walked in the Galilee? He walked in the Galilee, got into a synagogue. What did he do in the synagogue? He read the scrolls, of course, in Nazareth. He read the scroll of Isaiah. But what else did he do? He, pro- he proclaimed, but he also taught. He was a rabbi. He was a great rabbi with a lot of followers. Okay? A lot of followers. The multitude, we know, they came from all over the place. The Decapolis, the Jews, the non-Jews, everybody came to hear him. Right? So when we know that Jesus walked and preached at synagogues, and we find synagogues from the time of Jesus, we can conclude that these synagogues saw and heard Jesus. There are two synagogues in Israel which are a proven fact that they were existing in the time of Jesus. One is Magdala, which is the left side, okay? And the other one is Gamla. Gamla is a huge city on the Golan Heights. Most groups don't go there. We will. (laughs) Most groups don't. And that very large structure on the right-hand side, this is the synagogue of Gamla. Gamla is close to the land of the Gadarenes. What happened in the land of the Gadarenes? The demonized person, right? Exactly, legion. That's right there. That's right there. And that's also right next to the road to Damascus, but that's the next slide. So we have here synagogues that we can sit. Imagine, you can sit in those synagogues today, read the scroll of Isaiah, and it's exactly the same what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. And it's not maybe, and it's not assume, and it's not perhaps. If this synagogue existed in the year 30 AD, and Jesus preached and proclaimed in the synagogues of the Galilee, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Next slide. This is a brand new discovery actually two weeks ago. Bethsaida. Bethsaida. There's a very good reason why none of the groups never go to Bethsaida. You know why? We never found it. Don't laugh. For some, for some church denomination, it doesn't really matter. If the, some guy said, this is it, then this is it. It's all good. But we try to keep it very, uh, uh, as close as we can to archaeology. Two weeks ago, because of the rising of the water of the Sea of Galilee, a lot of the mud has been washed out by the lake. And we found this city, and this is the city of Bethsaida. So what you see now, I'm thinking you guys are the first one to see this, this is an aerial view of the beginning of the quarters of the buildings of Bethsaida. How do we know this is Bethsaida? We found a coin in one of the buildings from the time of the emperor that controlled the region in the time of Peter and Andre. So, yeah, this is Bethsaida. Not yet, it's just a survey, but we're getting there. Next slide. Lord of Sabbath. It's actually one of my favorite stories in the, in, in the Bible. We can sit down in Capernaum. When we're going to be in Israel, we sit down in Capernaum and we can debate because Jews love to debate. You know that. That's why we have so many lawyers. <laughs> you know, there's a Jewish mom that has two kids. One is four and one is five. And they ask her, so how are the kids? Well, the doctor is fine. The lawyer is a little sick today. <laughs> Imagine my mom when I told her, yeah, I want to, I want to be in the government. Oh, okay, so... Let's go back to, to this. This is a synagogue that is built on top of the synagogue from the time of Jesus. So when we see there, this is not what Jesus taught. It's above the layer where Jesus taught. Okay, so it's not as powerful as the two others. But this is the place that Jesus spoke about the Lord of Sabbath. This is the place of the man with the withy, withy hand. This is the man that they lowered down the stretcher. This is the place. And when you sit there on Shabbat, and you read what Jesus is saying to the leaders of the Pharisees, you are so hypocrite. If someone, someone's sheep fell into a pit on Shabbat, you really not going to pick them up? Seriously? Imagine to read that verse when you sit in that synagogue. All right, next slide. This is a boat that was found in Gennesaret. And the people who found the boat have no idea about scriptures because they call it the Jesus boat. Jesus never owned the boat. He was not a fisherman. I know that it sounds very appealing, but he was not. He said to turn uh, fishermen to fishers of men. 
but that was not Jesus. That was Peter and Andrew. Okay? So this is a boat that belonged to a fisherman around the year, uh, uh, between the year 20 to 40 A.D. So is this the boat of Peter and Andrew? We don't know. But was this boat belong to a fisherman that probably met, Ju- uh, met, met Jesus? Yes. Probably yes. And this is the only wooden boat that we have from the time of Jesus. And it's real. That's a real wood, which is a miracle by itself. Usually wood disintegrates in fresh water. But because of the silt, there was no oxygen. And in 1986, when the lake was so dry, they found this boat, and you can visit it. It's quite amazing to see it. Next slide. Last week in Jerusalem. You know, the last week of of Jesus in Jerusalem is a very powerful, uh, uh, you know, from the triumphal entry to the crucifixion and, and resurrection, and there are so many sites in Jerusalem that we can see and we can visit that correlates exactly with the scriptures. For example, the Pool of Siloam, that's the big stairs that goes down. This is the actual Pool of Siloam, where he healed the blind in John 9. We can visit the Pool of Bethesda, John 5, with the gushing of the water. We know it's there. These are, these are the real places. You can sit down in those steps and imagine the blind man who sinned, him or his, or his parents. That's the Pool of Siloam. We continue up. This is actually really cool. That picture on the left-hand side, the far left-hand side, you see that big arch? Everybody see that? These are chambers that were found actually not that long ago, 2014. And today we're starting to understand that the trial of Jesus was actually not down in the Antonia where everybody thinks. It was probably up there at the Praetorium next to the palace of King Herod. And you, we, we discovered chambers from the time of Jesus. Now, is this the chamber of Jesus? I don't know that. Unless he carved, Jesus was here, you know, <laughs> 33 AD. See you soon. No, it's not, that's not a, unless we find that, that's not him. But can we assume that maybe Jesus was here? Because when he entered, when, you know, when Pilate sent Jesus to see Herod, he came as a prisoner. So he didn't really come in in royalty. He came and probably were led down to the dungeon. We found a dungeon from the time of Jesus at the Herod's palace. So probably he was there. Is it this specific cell? We don't know. But that's the closer we can get. Then this is a brand new discovery, by the way. Those steps that you see, these are the original steps where Song of Ascent was written. And this is actually interesting. When you read the Song of Ascents, the 13 Song of Ascents, when you read the, th- the Song of Ascents, it says, Song of Ascents, I shall lift my eyes up to the hill where will salvation come. Right? This is geographically speaking. Because if you go from the low ground of Pool of Siloam, walking up, you lift your eyes to the hill where my salvation come. Put a little bit of more understanding of what the Song of Ascents mean. Next slide. Resurrection. We actually found... A bone, you see that bone over there? This is in the Israel Museum. This is a bone of a gentleman that was crucified. He was around the age of 30, at the beginning of the first century AD. So around the year 30, 33 AD, a bone with a nail in it, and the name of the guy was John, son of Chagakol. John, son of Chagakol. And when I show this, this is the only living evidence of crucifixion from the Roman period throughout the entire Roman Empire. Why? Because usually when the skeletons were left there to hang, they would dry and then people would use the nails, as gruesome as it sounds. But this discovery actually changed the understanding of crucifixion. Because up until this finding, we always imagined the crucifixion as like this, and the nail in the middle. Today we know how the crucifixion used to be. It's the cross and the legs on both sides of the cross, and the nail goes from both sides. Not like that, but on the sides. We know this because of this discovery. And someone, I remember when, when, when they showed that, someone came and told me, so can it be that this is the bone of Jesus? I uh, know he resurrected. So, <laughs> nice try though. You know, it's, it's, it's a nice try. So, talking about the resurrection, of course we have the garden tomb, and next to it there's a tomb. Fredo, did we, we go there, right? We went there. Yeah. This is the tomb in the Ella Valley. It's not the tomb of Jesus. No, not at all. It's the Ella Valley. But this is the closest that you can see a real tomb of a rich man like Joseph of Arimathea from the first century AD. This tomb was used around the year 40 AD. 
It's incredible, incredible to see it. There's a seal. There's the chambers. Unbelievable. You open the Bible, that's exactly what it describes. And, of course, the garden too. Now, this is this big debate. Where is the place of uh, burial and resurrection of Jesus? Is it the garden tomb or is it the church of Holy Sepulchre? Well, again, since we were never going to find a body, we will never know. And I said, I did it yesterday. The church are going to, are going to ruin the atmosphere in this church as well. Let's throw another stick to that pile. When Jesus was crucified, the veil was torn in half. And the only place you can see the veil torn in half is if you're facing east, if you're in, if you're in the east side of the temple, facing west. The only place you can do that is Mount of Olives. So I'm going to throw a bomb to this crowd right now. Maybe Golgotha was actually on the Mount of Olives. How do we know? We never know. Because we're never going to find a body. But repeat what I just said a few times. In five years, you're going to see people going to Mount of Olives. This is Golgotha. Next slide. Book of Acts. So we're now entering into the New Testament. We have few sites which are associated very strongly with the book of Acts, uh, at the beginning of the book of Acts. The, one, the first one, of course, is Caesarea Maritima, the book of Acts, Acts 10, you know, the story of Cornelius. And that shows us the political earthquake that happened after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And again, read between the lines. Jesus ministered to both to the Jews and the non-Jews. Am I correct? What did Peter said to the soldiers who came to take him to Caesarea, what did he say to Cornelius? He was frightened. He said, I'm a Jew. I'm not allowed to associate in a city of non-Jews. Where did where, where this law came from? Just a few years before, not even a few years, just a few months before, Jesus was walking back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between the Jews and the non-Jews. What happened that Peter is so afraid? Folks, the political earthquake, political earthquake, of the crucifixion of Jesus was so strong that, the, that Pontius Pilate actually made a law that Jews are not allowed to be associated with non-Jews. Imagine that. Just a few months before that, Jesus was all over the place. And all over the place came to Jesus. Just a few months. And here Peter is afraid for his life to go to a non-Jewish city. That road that you see going up there next to that castle, this is Acts 9. This is the road to Damascus. Those of you who were with us last year, we were there. Next slide. After, uh, uh, after Paul's journey, I didn't write a lot about, I didn't write at all in this presentation about Paul's journey. I wanted to speak about Revelation. And I wanted to focus on Revelation because uh, it, it, was, it was a conversation that I had with uh, a pastor from Virginia about two weeks ago when I, when I, read, when I made this presentation. And he had this really beautiful southern accent, which I, I adore. And he told me, in the, you know, it was, a, it was a big Zoom meeting, like 200 people or something like that. And then the pastor said, now, Mr. Eshel, hello, the Eshel, Mr. Eshel, would you agree with me that, that COVID-19 is the wrath of God? I said, um, wrath of God is the flood, locust, and brimstone coming down from the heaven. That's wrath of God. COVID-19 is sit at home and watch Netflix. <laughs> but still, a lot of people talking today about the end of time and Revelation, and I wanted to touch a little bit about, about Revelation. So, next slide. We are now going to uh, Turkey. This is David Barton, my dear, dear, dear friend, by the way. If you, you know him? You know David Barton? He runs a ministry by the name World Builders. Uh, which is in Texas, has absolutely nothing to do with the wall with Mexico. <laughs> wall builders, Nehemiah. <laughs> okay, today is a little bit politically incorrect to say wall builders, but sorry, that's from the Bible, that's Nehemiah. So David and I led a study tour to Turkey. And for many people, when they go and see the churches of seven churches of Revelation, that's a misunderstanding of the biblical text. That you, can, you can see that the, the, when people arrive into the, the, the cities, Laodicea, uh, uh, oh, Taitara, there's nothing there, but Laodicea, Sardis, they're looking for a church. It's seven churches of Revelation. Where's the church? For those of you who are with me in Israel, in Caesarea Philippi, you remember that Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my, no, my community. 
my community. The word church is a mistranslation of Greek. When the Greeks translated the Bible, they translated community into church. Why? Because synagogue, synagoga is community, to commute together. In Hebrew, you say Beit Knesset, Knesset Kinus, community. All right? So when Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church in Greek, my community in, in Hebrew or in English, same thing goes to the book of Revelation. When you read in the Bible, it says, to the angel of the church of, but it's not. It's to the angel of the community of, because the church are the followers of Jesus at the first, second, third, and fourth century, which most of them, by the way, were Jews. Up until the, uh, the fourth century AD, the Romans called the Messianic Jews, they called them strange Jews because they were not rabbinical. But in a way, they were rabbinical because Jesus was approached and understood as a rabbi. Not rabbi what we understand today. Rabbi in meaning of a teacher. A rabbi in Hebrew is someone that teaches. Mori ve-rabbi maran atta. The master is coming. Okay? More, more, rabbi, teacher. Okay? Today, a rabbi is a religious figure. That's not the case in Hebrew. It shouldn't be. Today, yes, but that's not the real meaning. So Jesus was, was approached as a grand master of knowledge, apart from the divine understanding. But, but who is uh, Jesus? Above everything, he is a teacher. That is why the seven churches, the seven, the seven uh, uh, the letters to the churches are letters of a teacher. They come to teach you what to do. Okay? Now, when you read those letters, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, you read the letters and it's like, you're not hot, no cold. What do you mean? Let's try to dive into this. Can I see the next slide? So let's take, let's take uh, 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 the lukewarm uh, 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 letter. Anyone can read that? Come on. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Danny, you wanted to read us for us what it says? the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. What a strange letter. You're not cold nor hot. What does it mean? When you go to Turkey, Asia Minor, when you go to Asia Minor, and you add Laodicea, Laodicea is based exactly between two major natural uh, 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 phenomena. On one side, you see that mountain in the back. You see that? That mountain is next to the city of Colossae. Huge mountain with icy cold water. Across from it, it's one of the largest deposits of hot springs in all of Turkey. Laodicea is right in the middle. Right in the middle. All right? So when Jesus talks, it's John who writes it, but Jesus dictates. When Jesus speaks to Laodicea, he speaks about the fact you're not here, you're not there, lack your geographical location. You're lukewarm, because that is the connection of the water that comes from the mountain and the hot springs that come from the valley, and it's right there in Laodicea. And when you're there and you see that phenomenon, you understand. What does it mean, that lukewarm? And that's read really, again. It's not to the angel of the church of Laodicea is to the guardian of the community of Laodicea. That's how we need to read it. All right? Can we do the next slide? This is Pergamon. By the way, the, the name parchment paper comes from Pergamon. This is where it was invented. Parchment paper. Pergamon used to have a humongous temple to the god Zeus, and then later on to Jupiter. That temple today is being displayed in Berlin, in Pergamon Museum. And it says in, uh, 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 in the letter to the angel of Pergamon about the seat of Satan. Folks, this is, not a, it's, this is not a description of something that doesn't exist. Seat of Satan is that huge structure that you can see today in Pergamon and also in Berlin. All right? So when John writes the letters to those communities, 
He's using icons of those communities that they will understand exactly what he's talking about. Seed of Satan, you can see it today. That part over there, that not, not the theater next to it, to the, to the right. This is the seed of Satan in Pergamon. Next slide. Ephesus. Ephesus is actually very interesting to look at, at, the, at the, the, the letter uh, to Ephesus. It speaks about the seven stars. The one who walks among the seven stars with the seven lamps. Ephesus was one of the strongest and most important cities in the entire Roman Empire. We know in Acts 25 when Paul comes into Ephesus and he really, really aggravates the people of Ephesus. He really does. And they start shouting at him, greater is Artemis to the Ephesus. Uh, well, I'm translating from Hebrew. I don't remember no, I was saying in English. I hope I was correct. Greater is Artemis to the, to, to the Ephesians. Uh, to the Ephesus. And he's almost be, get killed in Ephesus. Ephesus was one of the strongest and most predominant uh, 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 cities in the, entire, in the entire East. Okay? And this is exactly what the Bible speaks about, the seven stars. It was looked upon as a, uh, a beacon of light or a beacon of wealth among all the other cities. Okay? So when, again, when you read the Revelation, you have to be there in order to understand why the text was written in such a strange way. Okay, these are just examples of, of things that we can see. Also, in Ephesus, in Ephesus, you see that it says here, midst of the seven golden lampstands. You see that? Golden lampstand also is a metaphor of knowledge. Okay, of knowledge and explanation and, and a center of study. What you see over there, this is the grand library of Ephesus from the time of Paul. So again, when John writes to, uh, 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 to the churches, he uses icons so they will know exactly what he's talking about. In a way, Book of Revelation to, let's say, to the naked eye is actually one of the most difficult books in the Bible because it's not so understandable, right? But yet again, when you know these things, it's actually one of the easiest and most understandable book in the entire Bible. There's no hints over there. People think that Revelation is, you know, is a lot of metaphors and a lot of uh, 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 theoretical speaking. Not at all. Not at all. The book of Revelation is exactly to the point, and, and those that the, the Revelation letters were addressed to knew exactly what Jesus means. Exactly. Now, I can tell you, for example, John wrote the, 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 the book of Revelation in the island of Patmos. Right? On the island of Patmos, we know exactly where the island is. And I just told uh, uh, Daniel on the, way, on the way in that the Greek Orthodox Church has a cave over there. And they take millions of tourists every year to show them the place where John wrote the Revelation. Did he ever say in the Bible that John said in the cave? No. No. But hey, if, if it's for tourism, why not? When we're going to be in Patmos, please don't offend the guide and tell them, show me in the Bible where it, where it says that John was there. I did that mistake once. I'm a pretty much a persona non grata in Greece. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. I don't know if I have another. Can, can you do another slide? So what we've seen here, uh, by the way, this presentation is uh, uh, it's for you to take. Use it as much as you want. Please be my guest. I put down uh, uh, how... Well, the seven, seven churches, we can visit most of the seven churches. We cannot visit Thyatira because there's really nothing there. Thyatira is just a hill. It's a tail. It's not excavated, no nothing. There's nothing there. But one of the things that I strongly urge, when we read uh, 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 the Bible, we have to remember that the Old Testament and the New Testament are completely intertwined to each other. Book of Revelation is heavily affected by Daniel by Isaiah, by Ezekiel, and most definitely by Zechariah. Most definitely. When you look at Zechariah 14, that's the triumphal entrance of the second coming, not the first coming. Because in Zechariah 14, we're going to have the split of Mount of Olives. All right? So when Jesus came the first time, it was Mount of Olives, but there was no split. That's what Zechariah speaks about, and that connects to Revelation. Am I making myself clear or not so much? Clear? All right. So... Book of Revelation is basically resonates what it says in the other apocalyptic books of the Bible, Daniel, 
uh, 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 Ezekiel, Isaiah, uh, and, and Zechariah. And um, it also has a lot, of, a lot of connection to other stories of the Bible. We have to remember that the Bible didn't just happen in Israel. It happened in the entire region. For example, when you go to the city of Troy, all right, city of Troy is connected to the Philistines. It's absolutely incredible. You go to see the city of Troy that we all know from the, from the uh, Aliada, right? With the big horse and everything. We know that story. But the actual structure of the city of Troy looks exactly the same like the cities of the Philistines in Israel. Why? Because when the city of Troy was destroyed, some of the refugees joined other tribes that moved down from Greece to Israel, and these are the Philistines. Another connection, you know, Uriah, the guy that David was not such a good, such a good friend with, right? Uriah the Hittite. Hittite is Turkey. The land of Hatti. Hatti is Antioch. So we have to remember again when we read the Bible, it's not micro. It's not, bless you, it's not on one spot. It's global. And when we understand that, we understand that the New Testament is completely embedded into the Old Testament because of Jesus' teaching, we can really understand the Bible much, much, much better. Next slide. Questions? You guys in shock? <laughs> Questions, please. Just before you move to questions, uh, aren't you glad you did this on a Friday night? I mean, you said to yourself, why in the world are we going to Ridgefield Nazarene on Friday night? Aren't you glad you came? In the next few minutes, yeah, for sure. And one of the reasons that we are so impressed with Omer is that not only has he shown us tonight the evidences that the Bible is true, but he's shown us with his spirit the passion of his heart for the Lord, for the Word of God. And this man is a humble man of integrity, like few you will meet among Jewish people. He is not rabbinical, as you can see. He is biblical. He's not caught up in traditions. He's deeply humbled by the Word of God, and he knows the Bible. So if you've never been in Israel, tonight you've had a taste of what you could experience when you go to Israel with Pastor Frida. She's dreaming that by about this time next year or so, she'd be able to take another group. And Omer has already committed that he would guide Frida's group whenever she's able to lead another team. Now, some of you, how many of you have been there before? Yeah, I, you know, I knew we were talking to the choir, but there are a few of us, a few of you who've, who've never been there. I can tell you, Carol and I, my wife is here. She's back by the jewelry table. There she is. So my wife and I actually led groups to Israel seven times, and then we said, We've just got to move there. And I can tell you living there was amazing. But being there with Omer is like a whole year of living in Israel. And when you're finished after 10 or 11 days, you're going to feel like you've been there a whole year. It's amazing. So, Omer, thank you for this great presentation. We have the opportunity now to actually ask questions. And no question is silly. No question is stupid. And every question matters to Omer. He loves this point in our journey together. So he grew up in a Jewish home that loves Jesus' stories and read the New Testament. You can tell he loves the whole Word of God. Very unusual for Jewish people. And so he's, he's very happy to answer any question that you have tonight. So let's just pepper him with questions for the next several minutes, shall we? There's one. Please. Let me, just, let me just hold on real quick. We have a good audience watching online. I want them to hear all the questions. So go ahead, stand up. I'll bring you the microphone, and then go ahead and ask your question. When, when we were in Israel with you in 2018, they were uncovering some of the city of David, but there wasn't a tremendous amount. Can you tell us how much more has been uncovered there, what, what we'd be able to see now? 
Actually, they uncovered a huge part of the city of David, huge part, the entire street. You remember when we were there, I showed you the beginning of the street. After we finished at the Pool of Siloam, we walked aside a little bit into those huge digs, and I pointed out a few steps and said, these are the real steps of the Song of Ascents. It's blocked because it's under excavation. They found the whole street. You can walk the whole street today. It's not open to the public yet because of COVID. They stopped the digging, but once it will be open, you're going to walk on the same road that Jesus walked 100% because this street was destroyed in the year 70 AD, never to be rebuilt again. So we know for a fact that he walked there. So that's one of the biggest discoveries that they found in the city of David. Yes, please. Just a few minutes ago, you did that directional thing about the renting of the, the veil. Can you go over that directional? The what? I'm sorry? When they, the veil rent in half. Yeah. Is, can you do that directional thing again? Sure, sure. So when we read the scriptures, we know that when Jesus was crucified, there were two things. There was the earthquake, okay? And there were, the veil was torn in half. Now, if this is the temple right here, okay? This is west side, okay? This is the western wall right over here. This is the city of Jerusalem. Okay, this is, I'm studying the city of David, and all this ridge right over here, this is Mount of Olives. The temple is facing to the east. The entrance is facing to the east. So the only place you could have seen the veil being torn in half is if you stood on Mount of Olives. But Golgotha, according to the Catholics, is right here on the west side, and the garden tomb is in the north side. None of them could have seen the veil being torn in half. So again, I'm throwing an idea, maybe it was actually on Mount of Olives. Other yes. How much freedom do you have you to? How much free, How much freedom do you have to uh, travel in Turkey? Oh, a lot. Yeah, no, no problem. Turkey. Turkey is a huge country. Turkey is actually the size of Texas, unlike Israel. In Israel, you drive five minutes to see five hundred different sites. <laughs> Turkey, not so much the same. Turkey. Turkey is humongous. So. The troubles that we hear about Turkey are way, way on the east side, in what we call Van area, Van, Trabzon, all that area that bordered with the Kurds, way to the east, way to the east. Laodicea and the seven churches of Revelation are way to the west of Turkey. They're actually bordering with Greece. So that area is completely safe. I was just there. That trip that you saw was in January, 2020. So very safe, very, very, very safe. Other questions? It's the most Jewish thing in the world, by the way, to learn Bible on Shabbat. The biggest, the most Jewish thing in the world. Yes. I was confused when I was looking at the, uh, the crucifixion with the, the feet or the ankles. Mm -hmm. And you said that the, the, the people that were crucified had their legs on each side. Right. Okay, where did they, how, how did they get the, the nails through the side without breaking any bones. They broke the bones. That's okay, exactly now, it. Now Jesus was not allowed to have broken bones. True. So True. how does that work? When you look, well, well, Jesus was also supposed to be dead after five days. Right. And he died after three hours. Mm -hmm. So when you look at, at the crucifixion, this crucifixion, we do not know for a fact that Jesus was crucified in the exact same way. This is not the bone of Jesus. This is the bone of John, son of Hagakol. So, can we say that everybody was crucified like this? No, we cannot. But if you look at the crucifix that is used in the Catholic Church, even if you have two feet like this, bones are still broken. So, how will that work? So, we don't know. I'm going to throw here an idea. Maybe his legs were tied on the side and not with a nail. Okay? Maybe. We don't know. Maybe he was tied the whole thing. Some, by the way, some churches show Jesus tied to the cross, not nailed to the cross. Right? The nail holes, again, so if you have nail holes, then is not a, you know, his bones are broken. You will break a bone. You will. But I can understand the question because you say that the sacrifice, the lamb, has to be complete. 
understand that. The question comes from, because of the laws of sacrifice, the lamb has to be complete. But this is a rabbinical way of understanding. Mm-hmm. and driving the, the nails in the hands. Well, apparently the Greeks considered the wrist up to be the hand. Mm-hmm. And he said you could actually go uh, to the wrist and where the bones actually separate. You can do this over the ankle because yeah. you, have, you, have, uh, you have a joint over there. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. True. Other questions? It possible that Jesus was crucified on Mount Moriah, mm-hmm. you know, the same place where Abraham with Isaac and then also David. It, what, do you, what do you say about that? No. 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 Okay. I'll tell you why. There's also these two uh, uh, um, politically correct hypotheses today. One says that the temple was down at the bottom of the city of David where the Gihon Spring is, which makes absolutely no sense. Why? Because in the Sifting Project, of the Temple Mount, we found pieces of the temple in Mount Moriah. So if we find pieces of the temple in Mount Moriah, as much as I give respect to those professors who claim that the temple was down below, archaeology proves otherwise. Same thing goes to Mount Moriah itself. Jesus could have never been crucified on Mount Moriah because Mount Moriah is the temple. And you cannot bring any dead person into the temple, even the vicinity of the temple. Next to it, yes, but not the Temple Mount itself. So, no one, Mount Moriah. Other questions? That's it? Oh, come on. Please. All right. I use the NASB translation for my Bible studies. And because it's a word-for-word translation, right, of the Greek. So, but from what you said when you were talking about the seven... uh, Churches? uh, No, the seven lampstands being Mm -hmm. uh, the books of knowledge or something. Mm -hmm. So where would a person like me find that type of information? What is there a particular translation that, that shows the true Hebrew, Greek... I'll tell you my biggest problem on this question. You know which translation I read my Bible? I don't. It's in Hebrew. <laughs> well, that's right, because we looked at your Bible. <laughs> so when, when people ask me, what is the best translation of the Bible? I have no idea. Oh, I never duh. read it in any other language. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, to a point that we're in Israel, when we're in Israel, and I quote from the Bible, I feel I've seen it, the friends you saw it, I read in Hebrew and I translate in my own English as we speak because I have it in Hebrew, right? Yeah. Several archaeologists have said that the mosque and the temple can be built side by side, Mm -hmm. the third temple. Do you share that opinion or do you think that the mosque has to be destroyed to build the third temple? Well, again, this is is the politics I'm going to explain. In Mount of Olives today, which is governed by Israel, however, it's controlled by Jordan, okay, you have two main buildings. You have the Dome of the Rock, which has no significance to the Muslims, and that's the Golden Dome. That's the beautiful dome. That's not Al-Aqsa. That's the Golden Dome. You have Al-Aqsa on the uh, south side of the Temple Mount, which is, this is the important place for the Muslims, that according to their tradition, their prophet went up to heaven from that Point, not from the Golden Dome. Our temple, our, our temple, was where the Golden Dome used to be, not the Silver Dome. So technically, can they both share the same mountain? Yes, they can. Technically, yes. Because their center, their epicenter of the Muslim is not our epicenter. Their epicenter is about 200 yards to the south of ours. Why it will not be there? because they signify the entire complex. Okay? Now, when you're going to Google today Al-Aqsa, you'll see the Dome of the Rock. But Al-Aqsa is not the Dome of the Rock. Al-Aqsa is the other shrine on the other side of the temple, on the Temple Mount. Yeah. 
I'm not sure I was understanding correctly, but I was hearing something to the effect that the uh, Muslims were loosening up the restrictions of the Jews coming up to that uh, Dome of the Rock. No? No. We cannot go. That, that, that doesn't just work with, with Christians, with Jews, also with Christians. You cannot go and preach in Temple Mount. You cannot enter to any of the shrines on Temple Mount, only to the outskirts. You cannot say the word temple. You cannot say the word Jesus. You cannot say the word God. You cannot. You can, very quietly. Uh, they actually have like a waqf police that will jump at you if you're going to say something. And I got a quote, Jeremiah, who said, you have turned my house into a viper's nest. That is so fitting to Temple Mount. It really is. But that's my own personal interpretation of it. Other questions? Well, if there's no more questions, thank you again so much for uh, letting me be here tonight. I just want to tell you before we conclude, um, Daniel said that before, I did bring also uh, the jewelry of my wife, my wife who makes jewelry, and uh, uh, she wanted to honor everybody because COVID-19 is tough on everybody. So whatever you see in silver, it has 30% off, and the gold has 25% off. Nothing to do with this presentation, but <laughs> I promised my wife I would say it, and I'm a good husband, and I don't, don't want to get shot when I get home. <laughs> so uh, again, thank you so much, and Pastor, thank you. Thank you, Homer. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, it has, again, been enriching and uh, educational and so helpful. So thank you for being here. And if, uh, if you, if we would like to financially support uh, Omir's ministry, um, here's a couple ways you can do that um, on your way out to tonight. Uh, we'll have an offering plate on the, on the chair right by the door there. And uh, what you can do is you can just write a check to Ridgefield Church of the Nazarene. We will take um, all that it's given and um, just 100% of it we'll, we'll write one check to give to Omir. And uh, also, you can also give online if that is easier. And if you are watching online, I just checked the uh, checked the feed a little bit ago and saw that several of you are watching on, uh, online. Glad to have you with us tonight. And you can easily give through, um, uh, you can give online, ridgenaz.org slash give. And here's what you do. You, uh, you go to the fund and you can do that as well with your smartphone here or now if you'd like to do that. Um, you go to give and then when it asks you which fund, just choose the second one down. It says the Bible comes to life, um, which is kind of how you talk, how do you describe your ministry in the name of your, your ministry. So just choose that option. The Bible comes to life and um, everything that is given using that fund, we will again, just uh, we'll write one check to support Omer and your ministry. So again, thank you so much for being with us and uh, have a great rest of your evening and we hope to see you again soon.